Welcome to Holy Heartbeats. My name is Nathan, and I narrate Christ-centered testimonies from all over the world. These testimonies include rapture and end times visions, near-death experiences, encounters with angels and demons, God, Jesus, and even Satan himself. Please consider subscribing to my channel if you are fond of listening to these types of stories, and let me know what you think about these testimonies in the comments section below. Recently, your incredible feedback has been lighting up my world, and I've noticed a few of you are eager to share your personal testimonies. To let your story echo, drop me a message at holyheartbeat7 at gmail.com. Your testimonies will be the star of our upcoming videos. To all of my subscribers, my immense gratitude for your incredible support. Now, without any more delay, let's dive right into today's story. Delivered from the Powers of Darkness by Emmanuel Amos Chapter 1 My Escape to New Life Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Proverbs chapter 22 verse 6 This is a story of God's works, mighty, wonderful, and mysterious, in obedience to the command of Jesus Christ, to me saying, Go and testify what I have done for you. Misfortune is often perceived as an inevitable hand of fate, leaving us feeling powerless to change the course of our lives. To some extent, this notion holds true. In the context of a person devoted to a higher power, such as a child of God, their life is believed to be divinely orchestrated, as mentioned in Proverbs chapter 16, verse 9. However, whether that divine plan unfolds as intended depends on various factors, including the individual's closeness to God, their perception of life's ultimate purpose, and the socio-spiritual environment they find themselves in. External influences can sway the trajectory of one's life. The turning point is reached when a person relinquishes their will, whether for good or ill. They can choose to love or hate, seek understanding or embrace misunderstanding. For a newborn Christian, the will to obey is a potent force, whereas for a sinner, the will to disobey is the most destructive force of all. When a child is left to navigate the world alone, they are subject to the influence of two opposing powers, the forces of good and evil, right and wrong, God and the devil. Every individual faces this challenge, and each must decide which path to follow. This aligns with the wisdom found in the Bible. Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he grows, he will not depart from it. It's undeniable that a child's mother holds a special place in their heart. An orphan is a deeply unfortunate child, more vulnerable to the machinations of evil forces than those with parents. A mother serves as a guardian of both body and soul. The tragedy deepens when both parents are lost, especially in circumstances shrouded in mystery. My own story began 22 years ago in a humble village named Amory Iriegbu Ozu Item in Bende Local Government Authority, Imo State. My parents did not belong to the wealthy elite, but my father was fortunate to inherit 42 hectares of land from my grandfather, a blessing that ultimately brought about the most profound misfortune our family has ever known. My father's good fortune seemed to arouse envy among distant and close relatives, though the reasons for their resentment remain unclear, perhaps owing to his substantial land inheritance. We were once a contented family, blessed with four children, Love, Margaret, Emmanuel, and Chiniere. My parents welcomed the first two daughters, and then, after a 14-year gap, I arrived as the only son, followed later by my younger sister, Chiniere. This brought immense joy to our family, but it was tragically short-lived. The first blow hit us when my beloved and caring mother passed away under allegations of witchcraft. Four years later, my father also succumbed to mysterious circumstances, with rumors of dark juju practices swirling around his death. Two years after losing both parents, my eldest sister, Love, vanished mysteriously, while Margaret, the second daughter, struggled with her mental health. It was a chain of misfortunes that shattered the happiness of our once humble family. My younger sister, Chinere, and I were sent to live with our grandparents. 
It was there that I completed my elementary education and later gained admission to Item High School. However, my education was cut short as financial constraints prevented me from continuing my studies. Shortly after that, my grandparents also passed away. Following the customary funeral ceremonies, an unknown relative took my younger sister Chinyere, and to this day, I have no knowledge of her whereabouts. I was forced to return to my father's house, where I was left to fend for myself at the tender age of 13. How does a 13-year-old child survive in the midst of his father's enemies, who had become his own enemies by association? I was filled with fear and uncertainty. It seemed as though these events had brought me to the brink of a life devoid of purpose. Did anyone care? Was there anyone concerned about the misfortune of a young boy? One fateful day I reconnected with an old friend from my elementary school days, Chinadam Anwukwe. Chinadam held a deep affection for me and, upon learning of my trials, introduced me to his parents, who welcomed me with open arms and treated me as their own. Life began to regain a sense of normalcy. I was well taken care of and once again found happiness. It was during this time that I believed that the God my mother had prayed to when she was alive must still be alive somewhere, for he had provided me with new parents, or so I thought in my heart. I savored this newfound goodness for about two years, until tragedy struck once more. Chinidam and his parents embarked on a journey to Umwahia, but tragically, their car collided with a tipper carrying laterites, resulting in their instant demise. When I received the devastating news, I felt as though my world had crumbled. The depth of my sorrow was beyond words. Somehow, I managed to endure the pain and assist with the burial arrangements, performing tasks like gathering firewood and running errands. Once the funeral rites were completed, I returned to my father's house and resumed my laborious jobs in order to put food on the table. I continued to toil in the fields, gardens, and even went fishing with the village elders. One day, a man from my own compound hired me to work on his farm for a fee of 50,000 naira. However, during my time at his farm, he subjected me to a series of unsettling questions. First, he demanded that I show him my father's land, and secondly, he insisted that I hand over those lands to another man, regardless of our relation. I vehemently objected to both demands, which greatly offended him. In response, he made a chilling vow to end my life in the forest. Fear consumed me and I fled, shouting for help. Unfortunately, because we were deep in the dense forest, no one came to my aid, but divine intervention did. He pursued me with a knife, but I, being younger and faster, managed to elude him, eventually stumbling into a pit approximately 1.82 meters deep, which was concealed by grass. He scoured the area for me, but after a while, he gave up the search. I later struggled out of the pit and, using an alternate route, returned to the village. I reported the terrifying incident to the elders in my compound, but as is often the case with orphans, no action was taken. This harrowing experience filled my young heart with a profound hatred for a world where it felt like no one loved me or cared for my well-being. I contemplated why anyone would want to harm me, knowing I had no parents. Life had become an unending cycle of misery. Looking back, I now understand that God's love shielded me from the devil's suggestion of suicide during those dark times. In my quest for solace, I turned to the church and became a full member of the Assemblies of God Church in my village, a status I still maintain to this day. Unfortunately, even within the church community, where some members were aware of my plight, I continued to feel a sense of neglect. It's important to note that I became a full member of the church without truly knowing Jesus Christ and what it meant to be born again. If you ever find yourself in a situation similar to the one I endured within the Church of Jesus Christ, I implore you to surrender your life to the Lord Jesus Christ. Scripture reassures us, Let him have all our worries and cares, for he is always thinking about you and watching everything that concerns you. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 7 Amidst the relentless hardships and suffering, a glimmer of hope emerged in the form of Alice. I had known Alice since our elementary school days, she was five years older than me and hailed from the same village. We shared the same classroom, sat on the same bench, and developed a deep friendship. In the innocence of childhood, we even made a whimsical promise to get married when we grew older, a notion that seems utterly absurd now. At the tender age of 11, orphaned, uneducated, and struggling to find enough food to survive, I found myself making such a commitment to a girl five years my senior. 
Alice eventually left for a cure to pursue her secondary education, but continued to send me numerous heartfelt letters that spoke of affection. When I encountered her again, I was 15 years old, and she was 20, having completed her secondary education and secured employment with Standard Bank in Lagos, now known as First Bank, where her parents resided. Aware of my dire background and circumstances, Alice extended her hand to help. She invited me to join her in Lagos and provided me with her home address, along with the generous sum of 50 naira, which, for a young boy of 15 who had never earned more than two naira in a day, felt like a miraculous windfall. It seemed that Lagos was a place of wonder, overflowing with wealth and the finer things in life for everyone to relish. In my mind, going to Lagos became the only path to salvation, a chance to escape my father's enemies, my own adversaries, the grip of hunger, and the countless other problems that plagued my existence. It was an escape, an escape from all that was evil. Chapter 2. The Initiation there is a way that appears to be right, but in the end it leads to death. Proverbs chapter 14 verse 12. But the wicked are like the tossing sea which cannot rest, whose waves cast up mire and mud. There is no peace, says my God, for the wicked. Isaiah chapter 57 verses 20 to 21. Life outside the embrace of Jesus Christ unfolded much as the scriptures had forewarned. Armed with 50 Naira and Alice's address, I embarked on a journey to what I believed would be a realm of freedom liberty, and enjoyment, qualities I associated with heaven, or at least what I imagined heaven to be like. As I arrived in Lagos, I was captivated by its beauty. In my eyes it resembled heaven, with its towering and elegant buildings, and everyone I encountered appeared to exude happiness, or so I thought. The city's bustling energy and people engrossed in their daily affairs filled me with excitement, and I declared to myself, now I know I am free. Upon reaching Akintola Road, Victoria Island, I was warmly welcomed by Alice and her parents. They were familiar with my origins, as we all hailed from the same village, but they were unaware of the relationship between Alice and me. Alice introduced me to her parents as the man she had chosen to marry, which startled them. However, after discussions with her, they reluctantly agreed with the condition that they would support my education. Alice, however, refused their offer and insisted that I live with her in her own apartment. Initially, her parents resisted this notion, leading to four days of intense arguments. Under some mysterious influence, they ultimately relented, and I moved in with Alice. Alice, a strikingly beautiful young woman, told me she worked as an accountant at Standard Bank and promised to make me wealthy, providing me with everything I desired in life. She urged me to relax and enjoy life to the fullest. My initial impression of Lagos seemed to be coming true. A few months earlier, I had resided in a modest hut in a small village surrounded by animosity, starvation, and suffering. Now, I found myself in a bustling metropolis, living in a well-furnished apartment with a beautiful wife who pledged to bestow upon me all the world had to offer. She showered me with gifts, money, clothing, and affection, and I was introduced to a world filled with these seemingly good things. The devil indeed is a master of deception, and the scriptures accurately state the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. John chapter 10, verse 10. Dear reader, remember that the devil never gives anything freely. Whatever he offers comes at the cost of your soul. This state of euphoria, however, was short-lived, as strange occurrences began to unfold after approximately three months. The Mysterious Experiences one fateful night, I was jolted awake in the pitch-black stillness, only to discover a boa constrictor lying beside me. I was filled with terror and tried to scream, but no sound escaped my lips. On other nights, I would wake to find Alice's body seemingly translucent, like a cellophane bag. Sometimes she would vanish, and then reappear. On occasion, I heard strange noises or witnessed eerie dancing in our living room. I could no longer endure these frightful occurrences, so I mustered the courage to confront Alice about them. Her initial response was one of violence and stern warnings. She admonished me never to broach the subject again, threatening dire consequences if I did. It was at that moment that I realized my life was in grave danger. I began to fear her deeply. Two days passed, and Alice approached me with a smile, bearing gifts and offering a warm hug. She professed her love and care for me, encouraging me not to be afraid and promising to explain everything later. She then took me to a nightclub where she reminded me of her pledge to make me rich and confided, 
One day you will know all that I know. We returned home, and life between us resumed its usual appearance. However, inwardly, I understood that I was in peril. The question remained, how could I escape, and where could I possibly go? It's crucial to note that Alice's parents remained oblivious to their daughter's involvement in occultism and spiritual practices. She sternly warned me never to divulge this secret to them if I valued my life. It's difficult to fathom that a 20-year-old girl could engage in such dark activities. To the outside world, she appeared as a beautiful and harmless young woman employed by a prestigious bank. Yet, in reality, she was a pawn of the devil. Sadly, there are many individuals like Alice in the world today, as you will come to discover later in this book. A Horrific Discovery One day, when Alice had gone to work, I made the daring decision to search our apartment. Despite her youth, the flat was extravagantly furnished. I stumbled upon four refrigerators, and upon opening one of them, I was confronted with a horrifying sight. Human skulls, various parts of the human body, both fresh and desiccated. To make matters even more chilling, there were skeletons concealed in the ceiling. In another corner of one of the rooms, I encountered a sinister setup that I would later come to understand as an occult chamber. Within this room, there was a water pot filled with blood, a small tree at its center, a calabash, and a red cloth nearby. The sight was so ghastly that I couldn't bear to continue searching. It was at that moment that I realized I was a dead man walking, with no escape route in sight. In despair, I surrendered my fate to whatever might come, be it life or death, and resolved to maintain my silence. When Alice returned from work that day, her gaze spoke volumes, revealing that she had learned of my investigation within the very walls of our home, perhaps even from her workplace. Encounter with the Occult World The following day, Alice insisted that I accompany her to a meeting, and I was well aware that I had no choice but to comply. We journeyed to a massive building on the outskirts of Lagos. Upon our arrival, I received peculiar instructions from Alice. She told me to enter the building walking backward, and I followed her lead. Inside, there was an underground conference hall with a staggering number of about 500 young men and women seated in a circular formation. Above them sat a man, only visible from the neck up, resembling a head without a body, a figure I later learned was the leader of this gathering. Among these young people were students, undergraduates, graduates, and teachers, among others. Alice pressed a button on the wall, and a seat emerged from the floor, signaling for me to sit. She did the same, and another seat emerged for her. She introduced me as a new member to the congregation, and they greeted me with applause and a warm welcome. Alice's status was elevated as a result of this meeting. Unfortunately, I couldn't comprehend the discussions that took place during the meeting. As it concluded, and we were preparing to depart, the leader summoned me to return alone the following day. This marked my initial contact with the world of the occult. That very night, at the ominous hour of 2 a.m., a time commonly associated with meetings and perilous activities for all forces of darkness and their agents, Alice roused me from sleep and began to reveal certain secrets. She disclosed, I am not a fully human being. I am part human and part spirit, with the dominant part being of the spiritual realm. The objects you saw in my chamber are used during my daily prayers to seek guidance from the spirits. As for the skeletons, I will explain them to you later. I remained silent, absorbing her revelations. She handed me some books on world mysteries to read and my naturally inquisitive nature led me to delve into them. As she observed my growing interest, she discreetly sent my name to an occult society in India. Following their instructions, I returned alone to the society the next day, and found myself among nine others and several witnesses, all destined for initiation. We were summoned to the center of the hall, where the following rituals were performed on us. Number one, a paste-like concoction was rubbed onto our bodies, signifying full membership, Number two, we were given a glass shot of an oil-like liquid to drink, marking us as agents. And number three, our heads were anointed with a gunpowder-like substance, indicating our qualification to study their mysteries. Unbeknownst to me, this initiation ceremony was being recorded in India. The following day, I received a letter with instructions to stain it with my own blood and return it to them using a specific method, avoiding the post office. I followed their directive fully aware that there was no turning back from this point onward. To turn back would mean death, a fact that was constantly emphasized, 
and I had come to realize that there was no hope of escape for me. Covenant with Alice Early one morning, she told me that there was an important ceremony that needed to be held at home. At 2 a.m., she brought back a crawling baby, a living baby girl. As I watched, Alice used her fingers to gouge out the child's eyes. This child's cry broke my heart. Then she cut the child into pieces, poured blood and flesh into the tray, and asked me to eat. I refused. She looked straight into my eyes, and what appeared in her eyes cannot be explained in writing. Before I knew what was happening, I was not only chewing the meat, but also licking the blood. As this was happening, she said, This is our covenant. You will never say anything you see me do or anything about me to any human being on earth. The day you break this alliance, your alliance will disappear. This means that the day I break this alliance, I will be killed. After this incident, I started to have strange feelings inside me. I have changed and can't control myself anymore. A warning for mothers. Do you know your house servants? What is their background? Do you want to know everything about them before entrusting your children's lives to them, and so on? You might ask how Alice got the child she slaughtered. So, parents, it is helpful to know the history of your house servants. When Alice saw that she had drawn me completely into spiritism and that I was rapidly getting invested into it, she was satisfied and knew that her mission was accomplished. She found me an apartment, helped me furnish it, and then ended the relationship. Covenant in India the occult society in Delhi, India, continued to exert its influence over me, sending a second letter with even more disturbing instructions. In this letter, I was told to perform incredibly grotesque acts, including eating excrement, consuming decaying and foul-smelling rats, and engaging in sexual intercourse with spirits in a cemetery at night. In return for fulfilling these horrifying tasks, I was bound by a solemn oath never to engage in sexual intercourse with any women on earth. In response to this distressing letter, I wrote back to inform them that I had no visa to travel to India and no knowledge of how to get there. Around this time, I had become deeply involved in illicit activities, particularly smuggling, thanks to the supernatural powers that were now at my disposal. Customs and other authorities posed no obstacle to my activities, and I began to amass significant wealth. Money, food, and material possessions were no longer in short supply for me. One day, as I returned home and unlocked my apartment door, I was startled to find a man sitting in my living room. Fear gripped me, and the stranger identified himself, asking if I was Emmanuel Amos. I confirmed my identity, and he informed me that he had been sent to take me to India, instructing me to prepare myself. I secured the apartment, took a seat beside him on the couch, ready to obey any further orders. Suddenly he touched me, and in an instant, we vanished. The next moment I found myself in a vast conference hall in Delhi, India, where a substantial congregation had already gathered, eagerly awaiting our arrival. Files were presented to me with my name already inscribed, and I was asked to sign beside it, which I did. Then, a tray containing human flesh, cut into pieces, along with a basin filled with blood, was brought forward. Each person in attendance received an empty jug. A headless figure moved among us, pouring the blood and flesh into the jugs. Various candles and incense were lit, creating an eerie atmosphere. The headless figure chanted incantations, and we all drank the blood and consumed the meat. With that, the meeting came to a close. The Initiations in India Now the period of my testing had come. I was sent to a valley about 200 meters deep. In it were assorted dangerous reptiles and wild beasts. These were to torture me. I was not to shout. For if I did, I have failed the exam, and the consequence was death. After seven days of agony, I was brought out and sent to a place called India Jungle. In this jungle, I saw different types of demonic birds. Demonic because some had faces like dogs, some like cats, etc. Yet with wings. Inside this jungle was a cave, and this cave is only opened by these demonic birds. They opened the cave, and I went inside. The things I saw are hard to explain. They were terrible creatures. Some looked like human beings, but with tails and without human faces, etc. This was another place of torture. The torture there could best be described as semi-hell. I was in that state for seven days and was brought out. I was then sent to a very big library that contained large volumes of mystic books to study. I later picked two books, Abyssinia, which means destruction, and Asina, which means giving life or curing. Later, I was given more books. 
I was instructed to build a chamber as soon as I returned to Nigeria with the following things in it. A native water pot filled with human blood, a living tree inside, a human skull, vulture feathers, wild animal skins, boa skin, and a big shiny laterite beside the pot. The blood inside the water pot is to be taken every morning with an incantation. I was also instructed never to eat any food cooked by humans, but that I would be fed supernaturally. With all these instructions, I came back to Nigeria the same way I went, and fulfilled everything. Back home in Nigeria By this point, I had fully immersed myself in the spirit world and could freely travel to any part of the world at will. According to the books I had studied, spirit beings inhabited the cosmos. Curious about the potential to increase my powers, I decided to test this notion. I emerged from my residence, recited incantations, and summoned a whirlwind, causing myself to vanish. In an instant, I found myself in the vast expanse of space, surrounded by these spirit beings. They inquired about my desires, and I expressed my yearning for even greater powers. After two weeks, I returned to Earth, having acquired enhanced powers from these entities. Despite the formidable abilities at my disposal, I remained insatiable, craving more and more power. It was then that I resolved to venture into the underworld, aiming to validate the claims made in the books I had been given. One day, I sought out a secluded location in the wilderness, uttered the prescribed incantations, and commanded the ground to open. Remarkably, the earth complied, parting to reveal a descending staircase. I descended into the ground, entering a realm of utter darkness comparable to one of the plagues recounted in the Bible during the time of Egypt. There I encountered a myriad of inexplicable phenomena. I witnessed individuals bound in chains, individuals compelled to generate money ceaselessly, a relentless workforce to supply wealth to their captors. I observed members of elite societies arriving to perform sacrifices, departing with gifts bestowed upon them by the spirits governing this domain. I also encountered church leaders seeking additional powers, enabling them to utter proclamations within their congregations that were unquestioningly accepted. For two weeks, I remained in this nightmarish realm, acquiring further powers before returning to the world above. To the outside world, I may have appeared young and innocent, but beneath that facade, I had become a formidable and dangerous force. There are many such individuals like me in the world, but true safety, I later realized, could only be found in Christ Jesus. Covenant with the Queen of the Coast One evening, while taking a walk near Ebut Meta bus stop, I noticed a young and beautiful lady standing there. Although I hadn't spoken to her, I saw her again the next day at the same spot, and the following day as well. On the third day, as I passed by, she called out to me. I stopped and introduced myself as Emmanuel Amos, but she declined to share her name or address. I inquired about her name and address, but she simply laughed. When she asked me for my address, I reluctantly provided only the street name. As I was about to leave, she mentioned that she would visit me one day. In my mind, I thought it was impossible because I hadn't given her my house number, so how could she find me? However, to my surprise, I heard a knock on my door a week after our encounter at the bus stop. It was the mysterious lady, keeping her promise. I welcomed her, though I wondered who she was and whether she understood the perilous path she was treading. She visited regularly, though there was no romantic relationship between us. I noticed that her visits adhered to a precise schedule, never a minute earlier or later. Sometimes during her visits, I would take her to places like the Lagos Bar Beach, Paramount Hotel, or Ambassador Hotel. Despite the time spent together, she still hadn't revealed her name. I decided not to press her further since I knew our relationship wouldn't progress beyond what it was. I had been instructed never to touch a woman. Unexpectedly, she shifted her visits from daytime to nighttime. During one of these nighttime visits, she informed me, It's time for you to visit my place. We spent the night together, and the following morning at 8 a.m., we set off. We boarded a bus, and she instructed the driver to stop at the bar beach. When we arrived there, I asked her where we were headed. She replied, Don't worry, you're going to see my house. She led me to a secluded corner of the bar beach, secured a belt-like object around us, and suddenly a force propelled us into the sea. We began to fly on the surface of the water, heading straight into the ocean. Remarkably, all of this occurred while we were still in our physical forms. At one point, we descended to the ocean floor, and to my astonishment, I saw us walking along a highway. 
we entered a bustling city filled with busy people. The Spirit World Within this mysterious city beneath the sea, I encountered various facilities resembling laboratories, including a science lab and a designing lab, as well as a theater. Toward the back of the city, I noticed young, beautiful women and handsome young men, but no elderly individuals were present. She introduced me to this group, and they welcomed me warmly. She then led me to places with intriguing names like the Dark Room, Drying Room, and Packing Room. From there, we proceeded to a central factory and warehouse before arriving at her private mansion. In her mansion, she seated me and revealed her identity. I am the Queen of the Coast, and I would like to collaborate with you. I promise to grant you wealth and all its trappings, protection, and associated benefits, as well as life itself, alongside a guardian angel to guide you. With the press of a button, a tray emerged, bearing pieces of human flesh which we consumed together. She then commanded a boa constrictor to appear and instructed me to swallow it. Initially I hesitated, unable to fathom swallowing a live boa constrictor. However, she used her powers to compel me to do so. These acts formed three binding covenants, the consumption of human flesh and blood, the ingestion of the boa, and the presence of the demonic angel, all intended to ensure that no secrets would be divulged. The demonic angel was granted the authority to discipline me should I stray from my commitment and to deliver food from the sea whenever I was on earth. I pledged unwavering obedience to her. Following this promise, she transported me to another section of the ocean, an island, to be precise. On this island, various trees served distinct functions. One tree was for poisoning, another tree was for causing death, a third tree was for invoking powers, the fourth tree was for healing. She bestowed upon me the ability to transform into various sea creatures, including a hippopotamus, boa constrictor, and crocodile. Then, in an instant, she disappeared. I remained in the sea for a week, and through one of the means, such as transforming into a crocodile, I eventually returned to the world above. The Underworld Laboratories I spent a week in Lagos before returning to the sea, this time for an extended stay of two months. I ventured into the scientific laboratories to observe their activities. Inside, I saw psychiatrists and scientists engrossed in their work. These scientists were dedicated to designing captivating creations, such as flashy cars, the latest weapons, and unlocking the mysteries of the world. While they sought to understand the world's intricacies, they could only go so far. Only God possessed the ultimate knowledge. I proceeded to the designing room, where I encountered numerous samples of clothing, perfumes, and various types of cosmetics. According to Lucifer, these creations aimed to divert humanity's attention away from the Almighty God. There were also different designs for electronics, computers, and alarms. In addition, there was a television used to identify born-again Christians in the world, distinguishing them from mere churchgoers and lukewarm people. Moving on from the laboratories, I entered the Dark Room and the Drying Room. The Dark Room served as a place of execution for disobedient members. The process involved draining the person's blood and then sending them to the machine room where they would be pulverized into powder. Finally, the resulting dust would be sent to the sack room for native doctors to collect and use in their charms. There were many other disturbing aspects that are challenging to convey in writing. Despite the powers I possessed, I still had not earned the privilege of meeting Lucifer directly. Instead, I was qualified to serve as his agent. Nevertheless, I was content with my newfound abilities, allowing me to confront, challenge, and manipulate various aspects of reality at my discretion. I wondered if there were any other powers beyond these, contemplating this within my mind. Dear friends, we will be sharing the continuation of Emmanuel Amos's testimony in our next video. Personally, I believe every single bit of Emmanuel's experiences and revelations. Satanic cults are rampant all over the world, and plenty of people had already fallen victims to their dark rituals and ceremonies. What about you? What can you say about Emmanuel's testimony? Like always, let me know in the comments section below. Hey everyone, thank you so much for watching. Stay safe, and I'll see you in our next video.